The good old clap, take one. That's right. How many of you knew what you wanted to be when you were seven years old? I did. I wanted to be a world champion. Hey, is there honesty involved in this podcast? Can we be honest? You can shut your fucking lips. And then I'll just say, put them up once. Let's go. He's like, you look too pretty on the wave. Get ugly. We can talk about DMT if you want. Let's talk to your boxes. Connor O'Leary, the god figure and lord and savior of surf shop kids throughout history, is now on the lineup. Thanks for joining us today, man. Wow, what an intro. I'll take that. Thanks, I've been waiting Dave. for this one. I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks for having me. How are you doing today, man? Where, where are you today? Who are you hanging with? I'm really good. I, uh, we are currently in Margaret River in Western Australia. Uh, the waves are... It's actually pretty good today. The comp's the comp's going to run, and um, and yeah, it's a bit a bit gloomy outside, but it's kind of keeping that uh, predicted onshore wind not to to blow out uh, too too quickly. So it's it's nice and clean out there for the moment. So uh, I think it's going to be a good good day for for um, for the boys and girls to to go and show main break how it, how it is. Excellent and. Who have you been hanging with out west? Like who who's your crew you're running around with? And are you surfing main break exclusively or you've been you've been bouncing around? So I've got my wife here. She's actually never been to Western Australia. So it was a, a great opportunity for her to to, to bring her over and, and uh, experience Western Australian culture. And I, I feel like, you know, compared to the east to west, I feel like it's they're so vastly different and the West Coast is so raw and and still has it. You, you know, the the East Coast is still just as beautiful, but there's definitely a different factor uh, in the West. And yeah, she's never been over here, so yeah, thought we'd bring her over here and take her to a few wineries and and score a few fun waves along the way. And I've also got my longtime mentor, coach, friend from Cronulla. His name's Blake Johnson. He's, this is uh, the Swelly and Dub Techno Viking. This is the Techno Viking. Ex- explain <laughs> Blake Johnson to everybody, in myself included, because I've never met him. Blake Johnson. So he, he's, uh, he's been my from from day dot. Uh, he's been my my coach and, and and mentor growing up. He had a pretty good uh, qualifying series career when he was uh, competing and. And then I uh, think around, yeah, 11 or 12, I started working pretty closely with him on my surfing and and just kind of created a great relationship from there. His whole goal was to to do everything he can to make me become a better surfer. And um, the, the first couple of years on tour, I didn't have the opportunity to take him to any events. And it's one, it was one of those things for us that, when I was a kid, he'd just take me to take me up and down the coast and, and go surfing and uh, find heaps of waves and, and really enjoy the experience of surfing and, and show how fun surfing is. And uh, we're, as a kid, we were, I was always talking with Blake, you know, oh, imagine, imagine when, when I qualify and, you know, we get to go, we had to go to the, the world tour events together and all that. And <clears throat> kind of made it, it was, it was good that, he, you know, he, the he runs a runs a surf school in Cronulla, which is a uh, super successful. It's such a big, big company he's got going at the moment because surfing in in this, especially in the Sydney region is so popular. So to be able to to grab him for for two events and and bring him over here and and enjoy the vibrant energy and the uh, the grom stoked stoked out frothing. Uh, 36 year old man he is uh, <laughs> uh it's, it's been great to have him over here i love it that's some real circle of life stuff there that's that's mm. fantastic so so let's start we're, well, i want to get to all the canola stuff but I, but i figured we'd start in the present and and kind of get your read on what's been going on this season for you we're we're back on what's your current headspace like and, and how have your expectations for this season match the reality yeah, this this season's been a a tricky one for me. I feel like it's been a definitely definitely been a, a tough one over the past couple of events, just because I think 
in my mind, the lead up uh, preparation wise, I feel like it was really good and I feel like I was surfing great. I had a lot of confidence going into the events and just in heats, I haven't been giving myself enough opportunity to, to perform and therefore it's uh, they've been yeah, running away from me. So it's been pretty frustrating, but I mean, this event I didn't do too well, but there was definitely some great takeaways uh, from this one in the retrospect of just showing my, showing myself that I, you know, giving myself the confidence that if I give myself opportunity, I can create scores uh, instead of just sitting and waiting and, and over expecting too much and relying too much on the ocean instead of creating uh, opportunities for yourself. And so, yeah, I feel like uh, this event for me in particular wasn't overly successful, but I'm definitely chipping away on that, uh, that goal of just trying to give myself as much opportunity as I can in heats and, um, I'll definitely be working harder towards that for, for Rotnest and, and for the rest of the year. You talked about your results so far this season haven't been what you've wanted, but three out of the four events at the moment, you went down to Gabe Medina twice and John John once, and those are both two-time world champs. And as you said, you've been putting up pretty good scores and there's been flashes of like world-class surfing, but at some at some point you run into sort of some brick walls in terms of talent on tour especially if you're coming on as a lower seed so it, it has that do, do you do you look at it like that and say you know what it's it is what it is things are going to start dropping my way and I'll start getting past these guys or I'll start getting different guys and and, and it'll work out yeah i think the the elimination rounds where i haven't performed well at all i've been the things that have been my burden. Uh, I mean, not, not the elimination rounds, sorry, the seeding rounds at the, the mm. very first rounds. Uh, they're definitely the, the things that I need to capital, capitalise in in order to get a better seeding into the, uh, the, the round two, mm. and which I haven't had been capitalising on over the past, the, since the beginning. So therefore I get stuck into the elimination round and then get in, Get it, therefore it puts me in a lower seed to then get through and have to verse those those top guys, which is which is you know it's all it's all it's all on me. It's not it's not uh it's not anyone else's fault. Um, it's just how it is. I I put myself in that position, so I, I need to do as much as I can to get myself out. And you know, having have, versing those top guys, like I said, guys like Gabe and and all that. If you analyze them, pretty if you analyze them and you watch what they do, you know, someone like Gabe who is so confident in not having to be on the best waves to, to create an opportunity and create a rhythm is something that I definitely see in him and, and want to do in my, you know, and replicate it in my own, own, own style. And uh, that's something that he did in the heat I had here at Margaret's that changed the rhythm of the heat. And instead of, you know, like, and then I got into a habit of sitting with priority and waiting for a wave that was was pretty rare to, to come through, you know, something that was obviously, something that looked good and it was obvious that it was going to be a good wave uh, was was something that was never going to come. So the, the fact that Gabby can create a score off, off a pretty uh, mediocre wave is something that, I'm definitely going to take away and try and use use myself because I feel like in that heat, especially I felt pretty confident going into it, backside versus backside, I feel like I could definitely, maybe not, you know, I'd be on par, I'd be on par with, with him in that, in that sense. And uh, I, just, I just got a little bit too uh, selective at the back half of the heat. That makes sense. Now, mm. something that I don't think gets enough attention in the surfing world, but something that I I obsess over and people I talk to obsess over is the the board manufacturing and the relationship to the team riders. And if you think of something like F1, when someone switches car manufacturing teams, it's like the biggest story of the year. <laughs> and you yourself were a, a long, long time Channel Islands team rider. You were actually the, the only 
the last man standing on the CT. Yeah. Um, and you rode Channel Islands at Pipe. And then, you know, March 10th, you're posting Instagrams and there's video <laughs> blogs going up and I'm going, okay. And then a couple of weeks later, you're running DHDs in Newcastle. And, I, and I'd love to get your your version of the events that led to, it's a, it's a major change for surfers. And I want to I hear the story. Yeah, it's a big change. Uh, yeah, I've been with, been with Channel Islands since I was about 16. So yeah, it was a, it was a big relationship with them. Uh, I just, I, I just, I guess I got to a, a point with, with Channel Islands where I just wanted to just see more and, and, and see, see what else was out there that could give me that extra, extra bit. Yeah. You know, as, as the, the career I have and where I want to be in my surfing, you're always trying to <clears throat> find anything, any bit of improvement, whether it's, your surfing or it's your equipment and and I feel like last year I got to a point with CI where I was like okay well I'm interested to see where while we don't have any events and, and everything to to see what you know see what feelings I get from from other surfboards and <clears throat> and Darren's boards were one brand that I've always looked at and gone I really want to try one of them and Fortunate enough, got the opportunity to to try a couple, and and yeah, they they just were feeling really good, and I didn't want to just because I had one good surf on on the day, and I didn't want to just go, oh yeah, I'm just, they feel good, I'm going to chop and change. I I spent probably two months really figuring it out and and trying to trying to make the right decision. You know, giving it a red hot crack to to make the right decision instead of just having one surf on it and it feeling so good, and then just changing, um, mm. because it's just not in my nature to to just jump ship so quickly. You know, I'm so grateful that of you know the opportunity that Channel Islands gave me and and to be able to work with such an amazing brand and to work with guys like you know Matty Penn and and from from Australia and also Brit. Uh, they gave me amazing opportunities and, and I got to have some amazing results and I just feel like it, I got to a point with them where I just needed, needed a change and um, a different feel and a different outlook on things and uh, as, you, as you probably know with Darren, he's, he's a very uh, in-tune character and, uh, as uh, and also as well with me living up on the north coast now, I, I, mm. I kind of have a bit more of a personal connection with with Darren himself, and and uh, he's always really interested in coming to watch me surf and and always trying to make improvements on every surfboard, and uh, that's something that I feel like I maybe didn't have with with the the CI guys. So uh, yeah, it was. It was a it was a it was a big change for me. The, probably the biggest decision I've ever had to make in my life. But uh, <laughs> it, it it was definitely a, a change that I wanted to make sure before I uh, made any rational decisions. So yeah, that they makes feel good. sense. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, it's interesting too because it seems like increasingly top top level surfers are talking about their performance and getting the ability to squeeze percentage points out of it, whether it's flexibility or boards or your psychology and and everyone's sort of treating it that way. I, I am curious about you know that two month window where you're testing boards out and you're figuring it out. Are you are you kind of open? Is everyone kind of know you're riding DHs? Are you getting clean skin boards and like surfing in front of Mick Fanning's house under cover of <laughs> darkness? What's going on there? Yeah, I well the first batch or the first couple I got, I just got the DH logo down below. Yep. Uh, uh, I mean the the Channel Islands guys were were great. They, I just I was very open with them and and they were and honest, which is the best way to to go about uh, a business business like that. And I just said to the guy, "Hey, look, I'm just going to try a few few Darrens. You know, I'm not going to do anything stupid. I'm not going to post them on anything. I'm just going to ride them around Lennox. Lennox is such a small town, so it's not like there's cameras everywhere like the Goldie and." You know, you're all of a sudden going to get a 
a photo posted right. on the yeah. <laughs> Why is he riding yeah. a down? <laughs> Up on um, stab so, or getting heated yeah. or something. <laughs> beach grit, beach grit, like Conor O'Leary's riding Darren's now. Uh, <laughs> so in that sense, it was, it was, Lennox is a great place for it. I just had a few, uh, few Darren's had the logos really low and it's, uh, the, actually the guy who glasses DH's boards is from Lennox as well. So he was, he was glassing them and then, um, sending them, you know, just telling me to pick them up in, in Lennox. And yeah, I was just kind of testing them out with, with Woody, James Wood, um, yep. who I've been working with for the past two years in Lennox. Um, just, just a lot of back and forth, just trying to pick, trying to nitpick you know, what's better and what's good about this board compared to the other board. And um, uh, just a lot of comparison over the two months on, on, yeah, just, just little, it's the little, at the level that we're at these days, it's that 0.1% that can make such a big difference. So it's really just nitpicking those finer details on, on comparing two boards and um, two different brands and, um, I kind of got to a point where it wasn't only myself that was had a lot of confidence in the DHs. There was a lot of people around me that yeah. that I trusted trusted with with all my heart. That that were kind of like, okay, well, you know, you're going to have to do something about this because these boards are, are you know, you're looking great on them. And I actually had a <laughs> I had a surf with uh, with Mick at D Bar on one of them. I think it was probably like four or five days before I went to Newcastle and he's kind of, I got a few, few good waves out there and he kind of looked at me and he's like, cause the, the Darren logo was really low. He's like, yeah, <laughs> you're on a DH. I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh yeah, Matt, yeah. He's like, looks good on you. <laughs> I was like, okay, Cra- thanks. <laughs> crafty mate. Darren's still yeah. putting him to work. He's, he's yeah, out there yeah. seducing world tour talent. Looks good on yeah, you, mate. I got it. Yeah. Yeah, he did say anything. He just said, it's a good suit for you, mate. And I was like, yes, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, and also to to be able to even be that little bit closer to, to working, you know, with the likes of, of Mick and, mm. you know, you got Steph and Ethan. There's a reason why there's so much amazing results from, from Darren because he's boards that are, are – top of the top so uh it's definitely it's great to be able to to just be that guy who's just kind of cruising on the radar maybe asking Mick a few questions here and there and um and yeah the boards are feeling great so it's just a matter of just uh putting them into into heat heat performances because I feel like I've been having some really fun free surfs and mm. and and all that so yeah well let's talk about that because this is your second time around on the CT, right? You, you, you were on, one rookie of the year, fell off your sophomore year, did the QS, came back. Does it feel different to you the second time around? Um, I guess I would start psychologically. Like, how are you feeling just sort of as a human being going up against world title contenders now versus when you were a rookie? Uh, I guess it's just... It's, it's just not as surreal now mm. because now I know that I'm worthy of being here. Well, at the start, it was kind of like, wow, like this is, this is crazy, you know. I'm sitting next to Gabriel Medina in a heat and then having to, to actually beat him and, and, and all that is, yeah, I feel like it was just more of a surreal moment when I first started uh, compared to now. Now it's like I know that I'm... Now that I'm that I'm worthy of being here, and and you know I'm I'm here to to beat these guys, and that's the mindset that I'm in now. You know, with the events that I've had over the past two, you know, the the Sydney of the Newcastle and Narrabeen, um, I feel like I lost a little bit of confidence in that sense of just because in the lead up I wasn't I was feeling so great, and then. In heat, I just wasn't performing anywhere near what I wanted to to achieve, and 
and therefore, you, as a human, you you know you you're going to have those doubts, and you're going to have those, you know, you're going to lose confidence and, and all that. And um, it was super frustrating, but you know, coming over to the West and and putting somewhat of some scores on the board definitely elevated that that confidence and that belief that you know I'm worthy of, of being here and and um, as long as I give myself opportunity then I um, am a sure thing of, of getting through through most heats so yeah was confidence something that you thought about during your rookie season or was it kind of more of a I can't believe I'm here I'm, I'm just taking um, that's the first that's the only step I'm taking is sort of this disbelief and I'm here to surf and I, I, I guess I'm asking because I wonder if that approach in your rookie year where you said it felt surreal was almost clarifying for you in a way where you're thinking like well I'm not overthinking it. I'm just going out there and surfing my best. Hundred percent. I think that's definitely the the way to put it. Is <clears throat> um, just because it was so surreal that I wasn't thinking about anything else apart from how cool it is to to be here and and as a kid, yeah, like like you already probably know, as a kid, I would have never have thought that I would I'd be in this this position and just being grateful of of the opportunity that I have and all that and then just being able to surf waves and, and, and catch lots of waves was a was a thing that I did in the first year that I definitely need to relay into into this year because especially more into this year because the waves that we've had on offer haven't been so great. So therefore catching lots of waves and, and giving yourself a lot of opportunity was the only way to do it. And that's something that I definitely didn't do in those those previous uh previous events. So yeah, I, I just think it's. I guess as you get older, you put more pressure on yourself and mm. and uh, over expect things for yourself, and it's just not having any doubts and and being purely in the present moment is is the way that I feel like I need to improve on, and um, yeah, that's something that I'm definitely going to improve on. Do you think the performance level collectively has changed since your first time around on tour? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think the the mm. level of surfing now is is definitely changed since when I first got on tour, and which wasn't that long ago. I, that's why I'm asking. You know, it no, was it like it was only no. like a few years ago, but yeah. it feels like it's changed is, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Level of surfing nowadays is it's something that is unbelievable it's which is great to to be a part of and it's something that also strives me to to always keep improving because far out the level of surfing nowadays is is unbelievable it's you know it's something that and it's crazy to think that it's only going to get better and better from now and and to be a part of that and to be constantly striving to to be up and improve like those top guys is something that is definitely motivating and, and um, yeah, bring it on. You mentioned that um, you and your wife now live up near the Lennox area and I want to get to that, but I, I want to wind it back a bit and talk about, you know, where you grew up in Cronulla because for such a, and I think this is part of its identity, kind of under the radar part of Australia, it seems to produce like almost an outsized amount of world-class surfers. So, for for those who are uninitiated, can you kind of describe what Cronulla as a as a township is like for our listeners? Yeah, that, Cronulla. Yeah, like you said, it's <clears throat> it's underground breeds breeds surfing talent, which is which is pretty strange. You know, you got guys like Gary Green and Andy King and uh, Richard Dog Marsh, and then you got guys like Blake and. And Kirk Flintoff, and there's so many great guys above me that are world class surfers, and for some reason they're all goofy footers as well, which I don't understand, but <laughs> I'll take it. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's it breeds surfing. I, I feel like when I was a kid, the surfing community in Cronulla was very tight knit, which was which was awesome. Um, you know, you're always surfing with with those top guys. Mm. And uh, it was just a great little surfing community that of of great surfers, and everyone was pushing themselves. I feel like 
my gap between those guys like Kingy and Dog and, and all that were is pretty pretty big. But I mean, I remember as a kid growing up watching guys like Kingy and and more more Kirk Flintoff than anything because he was the first guy that kind of closer to my generation that that qualified and, and did did a um, a year or two on tour and yeah just watching him every day at Cronulla was a huge you know inspiration because it was like wow this this is how you have to surf in order to 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 be in the to have a career in surfing kind of thing and that pushed me a lot and you know there's so that I feel like every town in on the east coast there's definitely a handful of amazing surfers and um for a small town like Cronulla to be able to breed such a vast you know breed of of world-class surfers is uh is something that I definitely want to keep striving for for and keep representing Cronulla as best as I can you know there's a lot of great little kids coming up as well underneath me which is uh pretty exciting you know got Jar- kid Jarvis Earl he's mm. he's probably our next big talent coming out of Cronulla and um, just, yeah, I think I'm just trying to fly the flag of, you know, you, just because you're from Cronulla doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're not going to have a career in surfing because I feel like down south of Sydney, you, you definitely, it's a town that kind of gets lost lost a bit in the surfing surfing world. You know, when I was a kid, it was always, as I was starting to do better in surfing, it was always like, the kids on the Gold Coast got a lot more publicity and it got a lot mm. more kind of, yeah, you just, the surfing world saw a lot more of them compared to, mm. to someone like myself back in, in Cronulla and uh, there was always talk of you know, moving up to the Gold Coast and spending a lot of time up there just to, to get my name out a bit more. But um, at the end of the day, looking back, Cronulla was an awesome place to, to help with my development, not only – my average wave game because the Cronulla Beach is not the greatest beach break, but uh, there's a lot of world class slabs and and reef breaks around Cronulla that uh, back in the day weren't as known compared to now. But uh, now they're they're still world class waves and definitely helped me with um, developing my kind of bigger wave wave game and throwing myself over the ledge as a as a young kid was was always scary. But mm. I look back now and go, yeah. I, it, it was an awesome development for me. I'm glad you brought up the, I guess, for in your case, like a, a request or a temptation to move to the Gold Coast. Um, because when you mentioned Kirk Flintoff, like he was on tour when I started, which was 15 years ago. And you're right. There was a big gap, right, between you and him, yeah. you know, several, several years. And it's something we talk about in this podcast a little bit where, you know, at least in California or the U.S., all the, all the major talent – not all of it, but but a huge majority of it, like when they're young, if they're identified or encouraged, and most of them do, kind of move to San Clemente. Um, they yeah. move to San Clemente to like train at trestles where that was just yeah. not the case when I was growing up. You had all these mm. sort of what you kind of described, like potential world-class talents staying and developing and living in their home communities. Um, and when you mentioned um, Jarvis Searle, like, I'm wonder. I was going to ask before you even brought up, you know, the temptation to move to the Gold Coast. Like, if if you think he's going to stay there, and if you think that's more of a thing in Australia, where it's not necessarily a requirement to move to, let's face it, kind of the epicenter of professional surfing on the Gold Coast to to become a professional surfer. One hundred percent. I I feel like it's definitely not 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 ne- not as necessary as nowadays compared to what it was when I was a kid. Uh, I remember when I was, I think I was a couple of years into to being sponsored by Quicksilver and a couple of the the Quicksilver team guys were kind of like, okay, look, I guess it, they were kind of like, it, it, you know, you'll get more publicity on the Gold Coast if you come up and spend a lot of time up here. And But that was the days before Instagram and, yeah. and social media and, you know, everyone seems to have a camera these days. So that... That whole thing now is it's probably not necessary because yeah if you got if you got a person with a with a camera and filming you a bunch and you can post it on social media I feel like that's the best platform to be able to showcase how good you're surfing and 
that then that relays to not having to go to the places like the Gold Coast and mm. and those hot surfing towns. Um, so yeah, I feel like nowadays it's definitely not not necessary. Um, but I, I guess it's always great to go and spend a little bit of time on the Gold Coast or those, like you said, like San Clemente for for the, right. the guys in America, just to kind of showcase your surfing yeah without having to just post post clips on, on instagram and, and all that just see it in the flesh and see showcase showcase the the surfing industry because the surfing industry is huge on the gold coast and everyone's you know surfing for i mean working for brands and, and all that Someone, and yeah, that's right. to surf and uh to be able to show them live on how you're surfing instead of being able to film for a week and put your best clip up of that week. Uh, yeah, it's always something something great to, to do as well as posting clips. Makes sense. Going back to you growing up in Cronulla, what was your home life like? Mom, dad, siblings? What was the, what was the body count in the house? Yeah, so mom, it was just mom, dad and myself for, for 13 years. Uh, I, was, I was an only child growing up. Um, which was great just because mum and dad were huge surf fans. So I just used to jump in the car with them and they used to go on road trips up and down the East Coast to, to find waves on the weekends. And that's kind of the the whole reason why I started loving, you know, loving the ocean and, and loving surfing. And, uh, yeah, at 13, I uh, got a little brother, which was kind of oh. cool. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, surprise brother, I like it. Surprise brother, yeah, at thirteen, <laughs> which was which was kind of a weird. Yeah, it was it was pretty strange thinking back. You could have been it. his uncle, uh, man. What was what was? Yeah, like? I know. I pretty much helped him help help raise him. You know, it yeah. was it was pretty funny. I used to go surfing, and then mum, I'd come back, and mum would be like, "Can I go? I'm gonna go go catch five waves. Look after him for me." I was like, "Okay," <laughs> like I'd pretty much be be a babysitter, which is. I mean, uh, looking back at it, it, it's it's it was a really really good life lesson for me. I think just being able to just being able to feel comfortable in, I guess, kids. Uh, I think, yeah. and being confident in in how to react to kids and 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 all that at such a young age. I feel like has helped me a lot, even now. Looking at uh, you know seeing seeing young kids and 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 being able to kind of connect with them without feeling a little bit uncomfortable because I don't know what to do with them. Sure. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely something that M- most I've, adult males at like twenty eight are like I, I can't hold a baby. Like what they're kind of just like they're kind of like oh, <laughs> <That's right>. oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think it was it was awesome for for me to be able to experience that at such a young age and and be able to have that life experience at such a young age because now I feel so comfortable in, you know, learn, knowing how to, to deal with, with kids and, and deal with them on a comfortable level instead of feeling awkward and, and not knowing <laughs> what to do. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was great. You mentioned in that story, which I, I loved because it was just so uh, normalized, but it was it was your mom being like, Connor, you're watching your brother because I'm going out to catch some waves. And your mom was a longtime competitive surfer yourself. And and that's from hearing it right. That's how um, her and your dad met. Can you tell us the story yeah. about that? Yeah. So mom was competing uh, at the time and there was an event in Cronulla. I think it was like the... I don't know some one of those one of those events in Cronulla, and um, I guess she she moved to she came to Cronulla for the event, and and they met there, and they haven't moved since. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, dad's 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 a huge fan of surfing. He doesn't have that competitive nature that mum has. Uh, he just loves loves surfing for the sake of it. he's done it his whole life. So. I've, I think I've got the perfect mix of that competitive yet kind of nice nature, which is which is great. That's good. You got to be able to switch off. 
Yeah, for sure. Definitely have to, uh, definitely learning how to, to switch off is, is key, especially in this sport because, uh, there's a lot of downtime for sure, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware. Yeah, it was <laughs> idle hands, the devil's work, or whatever the phrase is. Yeah, that's it. And so this year on tour, um, you've elected to update your jersey with dual flags. You've got Australia on one sleeve, which is representative of your home country, and Japan on the other sleeve, which is representative of your Japanese heritage. And can you talk us through the decision-making process for, for why you chose to do that this year? Yeah, so it was the end of last year that, <laughs> it's a funny one, we were just sitting on the lounge, my wife and I, and Steph, Steph looks at me and goes, why don't you, for next year, why don't you put a, a Japanese flag in New Jersey? Ask Renato if you can put a Japanese flag in your jersey. <laughs> and I sat there and thought, it's a pretty good idea. So we've, we've been talking about it for a while, but it, I think having that time last year to think about it and really acknowledge it was kind of, was, was a blessing in disguise. And, and yeah, big thanks to the, the WSL for, for mm. allowing it to happen and, and allowing me to acknowledge the other the other heritage in me, which is Japanese, and uh, it's it's been great to to acknowledge. And I've had some awesome feedback so far on on being out. You know, every, I've have got I've had a lot of fans and and friends and family in in Japan, and I've been going over there since I was pretty much newborn to to about thirteen. I used to spend about three months there a year, so. To be able to acknowledge and you know celebrate the the fans and and all that in, in Japan is and represent them as best as I can uh, is something that I've always I've wanted to do for a long time. But I think mm. it's come with with maturity and and all that. Um, as a kid growing up, being multicultural was I feel for myself I didn't acknowledge it enough. I you know, at school and, and all that, as you know, when you're, when you're a kid, being different is somewhat becomes a, a negative impact, not right. kind of not, it's not, it's not, it's not positive and, and shown as, as well as what it should be. And I feel like when I was a kid, because I was half Japanese and the whole multicultural thing wasn't as, it wasn't as recognized yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of my time and focus and focused a lot of my energy on wanting to be like my friends, which were full Australian. Yeah. Uh, and which I look back and go now and go, that was the dumbest thing ever. Why did you do <laughs> that kind of thing? But yeah, um, yeah like I said, just because it just because I was different, you know, I wasn't as I didn't recognize it. It, it was just a bit a bit of a negative impact on. On, on me and um, I just wanted to be an Australian kid. So growing up, you know, I was always, always, always Japanese and always had that heritage and, but now I think I recognise it more with a bit more maturity and, and think how cool is it to be able to say that, you know, I'm not only Australian, I'm also Japanese and, and celebrate that fact. Um, you know, as a kid, I spent so much time in Japan and and have gained so many friends and family and they're all such huge fans of me and and you know in this surfing career as as my surfing career has evolved my the fan base over there is is just as big as as my Australian fan base so I I felt like it was the right time to to recognize my Japanese heritage and and also inspire a lot of hopefully inspire a lot of multicultural kids out there to, to also celebrate your heritage and mm. celebrate your other half that you have because a lot of people that don't have it are jealous because you, you have it and um, recognise it, celebrate it, embrace it instead of uh, trying to, to push it away and act like you don't have it because uh, I feel like once I started doing this uh, from Newcastle, I got a lot of, 
great feedback from people saying, you know, they were in the same situation of mm. having that other half, especially in Australia, having that other half and not getting not getting bullied, but just wanting to wanting to fit in with the rest of the Australian culture. And mm. um, yeah, they're all stoked that I I kind of threw it out there and and said, you know, let's do it for our other heritages as well, no matter what it is. Um, so yeah. It's been, it's been good. It, it, it's a common enough experience, right? When you're younger, you just want to fit in regardless of where you're from yeah. and regardless of what your background is. And it, while everyone's collectively trying to fit in, you kind of end up going to the most common denominator, which is like really homogenous. It's like any, any point of difference that you have, you kind of forfeit at the door when you're younger because you just want to fit in. And yeah, um, I, I'm glad you talked a little bit about that because... You know, in doing prep for this ep- episode, um, two members of our team, uh, Chloe Kojima, who you know, because she's on tour as part yeah. of the comms team, and our producer, Ryan Fawcett, uh, both uh, shared a lot of thoughts and experiences of being biracial. And, you know, our mm. listeners might remember Ryan because he's been on the podcast before and he runs everything for us behind the scenes. And I mentioned yeah. him a lot on the show, but, you know, he and I have gotten to know each other really well since starting the podcast. And one of the things he brought up in conversation was, his experience in similarly in being half Asian and growing up in a place like Oklahoma, which to him, in his words, felt overwhelmingly white. And, and growing up there, he really lacked with a sense of identity, you know. Mm. And he said that he didn't see much of his Asian heritage represented in that place he was growing up. And it often kind of was a struggle for him to navigate his his roots. And so he did add that, like, similar to you, as he's gotten older, he's realized the importance of representing that side of himself. And I think you're right. That is something that comes with maturity. I'm wondering if there was any kind of, like, timeline points for you where you just said, you know, I, I am comfortable. You mentioned the conversation with your wife. I wonder if there was anything along the way or if it was more of a gradual thing for you. I think I think it was more of a gradual thing. Uh, I'm not an overly confident person. I'm that type of kid who, like you said, I just I'll do anything I can to just fit in and not be that person that you know the lights the lights on them and and I'm yeah like I said I'm not that confident person I'm just a just a down to earth little kid that just wants to just cruise under behind behind the scenes and and not have any attention focused on me uh, so as a kid yeah I just was just doing everything I could to just try and fit in so I didn't ever ever. I didn't ever have to be in the situation where I was confronted with, you know, oh, you're Japanese or, you know, that's weird because you're Japanese, like that, all that type of stuff. So I spend a lot of my time just not focusing on my Japanese heritage and even like just stuff like <laughs> like my mum used to be like, oh, I got, no, I'll make you some sushi for lunch. <laughs> and I used to, and I had it. I had it, I remember I had it once and I was sitting there and I didn't get bullied, but a lot of kids were like, oh, like, what's in your bag? It stinks. Like, like just like little like comments like that where I was like, oh, well, and then my, and then from then on, mom would be like, like, do you want sushi for lunch? I'm like, no, nah, can you just get me like a Vegemite sandwich? I don't know, like something that's like sure, Australian, yeah. like a peanut butter sandwich, just something that's normal. So <laughs> I don't ever have to like confront that whole, what the weird different uh, a vibe again because it, you know, for me, of course. it just made me feel so uncomfortable. And uh, now I look back and go, that was that's so stupid. Just because, you know, sushi. Like, why wouldn't you want sushi for lunch? How good is that kind of thing? I was so, gonna, I, well, I, that's a maturity thing. Like, kids are assholes. Like, is. you grow up yeah. and you go to college, and you're like, that guy's got a bento box for lunch. I'm pissed. I've got the veggie yeah. mite sandwich. I want <laughs> yeah. that. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. And as a kid, you just like. Yeah, now I look back and go, "Fuck, oh, yeah, that was that was pretty dumb." But yeah, uh, it that, it definitely came gradually with 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 age, and I think even I feel like even just before my kind of career kicked off, I still didn't recognize it and and, and celebrate it as much as what I should. You know, I had a lot of people that knew that I could speak speak Japanese and knew that knew how big my, my Japanese uh, culture was in my, in my life. You know, I pretty much spoke Japanese before I spoke English just because mm. uh, mum, yeah, I spent a lot of time with my mum and mum 
when I was born didn't speak much English. So she mm. spoke to me pretty much purely in, in Japanese. So I I learned English going to preschool and, and and going to school and all that before. Yeah, so Japanese was pretty much my first language. Um, mm. So, yeah, and then I kind of put it on the back burner for a long time and, and now I've brought it back up and a lot, I've had a lot of people like, wow, you, you know, you can speak Japanese and... I might not be, I might not speak Japanese as well as I want to, but uh, <laughs> I feel like not not being a, a part of the cult of the culture all the time and and spending that two three months a year in Japan every year definitely hinders my uh, my my Japanese language uh, barrier. But it's definitely something that I want to keep working on and keep learning because uh, it's something that I definitely don't want to lose and and want to show. Yeah, my kids, I want to teach my kids Japanese and, and have that bilingual, uh, yeah, bilingual culture in, in their life as well because I feel like it's such a great feature to have and, and it's something that, yeah, you'll never regret when you, when you get older for sure. Well, this is excellent. I want to get to a couple more topics and we've got some listener questions for you, but first we're going to take a quick break to get a word in from our sponsors. We will be no right worries. back. You're growing up in Cronulla, you've got this amazing uh, heritage uh, from both your parents and a love for the ocean. Was there a moment where you realized, I'm, I'm pretty good at surfing. I, I, I think this is going to be my career. Um, probably the year I... The year that I nearly qualified... Mm. was the first time I feel like that I was like, wow, I could, I could do this kind of thing just because it was the first real year where I was on the, the, the 10,000. Um, I got seated into the 10,000s. It was the first full year that I got on the 10,000s the and, um, and I ended up going to Hawaii at I think I was eighth. Hmm. Eighth or ninth? Eighth or ninth, yeah. And it was just a surreal moment just because it. I feel like that whole three-year span, it happened so quickly that I didn't have time to go, oh, God, like how? Didn't really get time to sit back and go, how cool is this? I think I just, it all happened and, you know, I, I fell off. Oh, well, I didn't fall off. I didn't qualify. I was three spots off and then that kind of gave me a lot of confidence to go, whoa, far out. If I nearly qualified just then when I didn't actually have a goal set to qualify, I just wanted to to just get my, my feet set in the in the prime in the ten thousand series and just get comfortable in competing against the the top hundred in the world. Why not try and qualify the next year and and yeah, and then next year the well, year after well, rolled around and hold on one sec because I, I wanna I do want to ask a question there. So you were not trying to qualify and you were eighth heading into Hawaii, yeah. was there a party that was like, if the Pacific Ocean goes completely flat and these two events are canceled, I've qualified. And then <laughs> conversely, as you mentioned, you, you fell a few spots out and you said that that gave you the confidence to do it again, but you weren't crushed? You, didn't, you weren't already making like CT plans and like booking hotels on the Gold Coast? No, nah, no. Nah, Funny you say that because no, there's not one. There wasn't one point in my time where I was like, "I'm going to qualify." Holy moly! <laughs> sure, like yeah. maybe there was a little bit going into Hawaii. Like I've got a chance here right, to yeah. qualify, but there was never like a wow. Like let's. Oh my god, what's going to happen? I'm going to get get to surf snapper with one other person type, <laughs> type thing. It was kind okay. of just. It all happened so fast and so quickly that you know, I was like, oh, "I've got to." You know, I, I didn't even, I, like I did, I wanted to always do my best in events and, and always have that mindset, but it was definitely not a goal to, to qualify that year. Mm. Purely in the fact that I just wanted to just get myself comfortable in the primes and then the year after, then I then my goal would be to qualify. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I feel like just for me, just because I was coming out of, you know, 3,000s and 6,000s and, and all yeah. that, um, it was just a, a way to try and set my feet and and then yeah going to Hawaii I was like oh my god I'm gonna qualify and then 
and then you know the wheels fell off at in sure. Hawaii, and um, which is fair because it was only my second triple crown ever. So mm-hmm. yeah, I just yeah the wheels fell off and and I fell off and I think I got thirteenth or something and uh, right, just outside the thing yeah. It was kind of there was kind of a little bit of a, it was a bit a bit of a bummer afterwards just because mm. it was like oh, I had a chance like and I didn't want to be that person who nearly qualified and then never qualified ever again. Yeah, that was yeah, my yeah. that was probably the only thing that I that came through my mind negatively. There's a, there's uh, a similar like kind of psychology to people that are get so close to winning the world title and it takes so much out of them that you often see the next year they like fall back to like fifth or tenth or fucking wherever. It's probably similar if you if you put so much into qualifying where you're like I got so close and now I'm like exhausted and and you know as you said you could be that person that got close and just never made it. Yeah, yeah. I, I there was it's, it's funny <laughs> one of my. One of my mates, I got home after after Hawaii. One of my mates, you know, it's Australian culture. You know, it's it's very humbling. You know, you, <laughs> your mates <laughs> your mates always keep you honest, which is which is awesome. And I got home, and they're like, he's like, oh yeah, you nearly made it. Like, definitely don't want to be that guy who nearly makes it. And, <laughs> yeah, you're like, no, I'm thinking the same thing. But you know, it's oh, interesting yeah. you say that because it's the uh, famously, right? It's the I'm half Australian. It's the tall poppy syndrome of yeah. you grow too tall, we're gonna cut you down, kind of deal. Yeah. But it sounds like your your personal journey, as you said, you're understated under the radar. Like you fit pretty well into that in a way. Yeah. And and at this time, I, I know you're working so hard on the QS, and it sounds like you're very goal oriented. Where it's like, it's okay, we're going to achieve that goal, then we're going to set a new goal. Mm. W- did you have contingency plans, um, as in like career contingency plans? Like, well, I'm gonna, I'm putting a little bit of my energy into becoming a pro surfer, but I'm also studying or I'm also working. W- were there anything on the? Was there anything on the side for you at that time? Um, at that time. The, the process of me getting being on the QS and, and all that leading into the CT, yeah, I was working with I was working with Blake at the surf school. He he gave me a job and um, yeah, I was just I, I actually looking back at it now, I think the surf school was great for me. Uh, not only the yeah, you know, just the, the having to work and taking the whole professional surfer out the window and you know at the end of the day you're just you're an employee working for 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 a company and uh that whole you know work diligence was was great for me and having to prioritize my time in and amongst trying to surf but also working as well was was great for me um just to organize and prioritize time and also I think it's funny with with the surf school I think being confident and comfortable with talking to strangers hmm. was a huge benefit for me working at the surf school. You got, you know, you, I was, I'm a sh- shit house public speaker, horrible. <laughs> like if you told me to, to try and public speak in front of a hundred people about something, I'd tell you to, no, I'd be like, no, <laughs> but you know, I, Working at the surf school definitely helped me get that confidence and being able to be comfortable in talking to twenty people and and putting having them around in a circle and you being the the shining light and explaining uh, what what you're going to do and what you know the instructions and all the process of 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 surfing and all that helped me to to be the person I am today in the sense of not being scared to to just say hello to a stranger and not, yeah, just being comfortable in talking to, to complete strangers, I feel like helped me heaps in, um, by working at the surf school. So, well, and it wasn't a lot of, well, go on, sorry. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say, and it it wasn't, I, I totally understand that. That makes a ton of sense. And it wasn't just the surf school, right? It was also the surf shop, the mob surf shop. That was Blake Johnson's as well. Uh, yeah. So, so, so speaking as a former surf shop kid, I want to hear all about it. Like, were you, were you 
unboxing the wax and putting it in the rack? Were you selling surfboards? Were you hanging up wetsuits? Yeah. What was the deal? Yes, yeah, so I, I think we took it in turns. I was working mostly at the surf school. Yep. But then doing maybe oh, a day or two a week in the surf shop. The surf shop was cool. The surf shop was really cool. It was something that Blake's, Blake's wanted for since the very beginning. Before he surf school, he's like, I just wanted a surf shop. I want to own a surf shop. Uh, so to be able to sit in there and, and have a customer walk in and you get to talk about something that you're so passionate about to them and then they get stoked out because they trust you in, in that sense sure. uh, was, was, was really cool. And uh, to be able to work in the surf shop, was yeah it was it was a great great benefit in like like I said before a lot of public speaking and just being able to be friendly and and be comfortable with complete strangers and talk to them and you know and all that so I did this is this is this is this this is also why you are our patron saint because literally every surf shop kid out there is thumbing through magazines and putting the videos on and thinking, yep, when I get my next discounted board and when the heats start bouncing my way, I'll be on the QS and I will be putting, you know, surf shop stickers on my board instead of yeah. like cleaning out old wetsuits. And you were the one that did it. And I, yep. and I fucking love that so much. Cleaning, cleaning, uh, cleaning secondhand board wax off them to, to make right. them clean and yeah. uh yeah stacking stacking boards unboxing wax hanging wetsuits up it was uh it's cool it's just simple simple living for me uh, which was which was great it wasn't only a job i actually really enjoyed enjoyed doing it as well so it uh yeah there were days that were kind of hard but that's just that's just a working class hero that's just uh, what you gotta I, do I, which I is something that you too. know i want to <laughs> Yeah, it's something that I just want to inspire a lot of kids on is just, you know, you could be that kid who's working at, I don't know, some surf shop unboxing wax. And, you know, if, you, if you're dedicated and you want, to, you want to improve your surfing, then go for it and, you know, you, the world's your oyster. That's right. If you unbox the wax, you get to tax at least a bar, and that goes somewhere. Exactly. So yeah. Sure. I feel like I'm just that type of kid. It's if uh, like it's it's cliche. I don't know a lot of people say it, but if I can do it, if I can be where I am today, any kid does not have an excuse on why they can't be a pro surfer. Purely in the sense of, I was that kid who never got. I didn't start with, you know, a major sponsor and I didn't start mm. with all the money and all the yeah, I didn't I didn't get didn't get the golden ticket. I always had to work hard for it and and be dedicated on trying to improve on you on my own surfing and and then it kind of flowered from there so and evolved from there. So yeah, if I can do it, any any kid who's got a dream can do it. And I know that sounds cliche, but it's, yeah. I, I like definitely. how you put that, you know, where y there's more than enough uh, case studies of sort of golden ticket kids that make the tour. And you were not one of them, but you did ride for Quicksilver for a period of time. Yep. How was that? How did that relationship start? Uh, it just, a, it was just this pure, purely based shop sponsorship. <laughs> it was, uh, <laughs> it was, I started, so one of, uh, Old time legends from Cronulla who run a who ran a surf shop back in the day it was called Cronulla Surf Design. Mark Aprilovic he had a connection with Kurt Jacobs who was the Quicksilver team manager at the time, and I was just started. It was just when I was starting to to do all right in the Rip Curl Grom searches and 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 all that. And uh, yeah, he he was fortunate enough to to give me a couple of wetsuits and a couple couple of shirts and shorts and uh, I put a put a big red sticker on my nose and uh, that was a really cool feeling to be able to go wow I got a got a sponsorship I got to put I get to put a sticker on uh, you know every board back top and bottom and um, represent try and represent them as best as I can and yeah it was it was a really cool feeling just cuz yeah to be able to I was actually one of the last kids in my little crew in, in Cronulla to to get a sponsor so 
you know, <clears throat> there was always times where I was like, why does everyone else get sponsors and not me? <laughs> it's bullshit. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Like they all get like, you know, I had friends that sponsored by O'Neill and Volcom and stuff and here's me just no sponsor and, and getting hand-me-down wetsuits from um, one of mum's uh, mum's friends who was a pro surfer in Japan. So I got all these like hand-me-down Japanese wetsuits, which was sick, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to to be able to get a sticker on my board and yeah, getting that was was a huge accomplishment. <laughs> it, it is a huge accomplishment, but as a sort of an objective bystander here, like it probably happened at a time where they were throwing so much money and as you put it, so many golden tickets around and golden tickets that never paid out. You know what I mean? Like they were, for every, I won't name anybody, but for every X golden ticket superstar on the CT, there's probably 10 or 15 or 20 from that kid's same generation that just didn't pan out, right? Whereas you're sure. on the other end, you know, it's like, I mean, they probably hit the lottery with you because they said, oh, look, like, we'll give him some stickers and we'll give him some wetsuits. And this is also a direct-to-consumer play. He'll probably sell more Quicksilver wetsuits at the shop than Rip Curl <laughs> ones, which is great. And he rips. And, and by the way, he qualified. No one expected it. Like, it's yeah. just, it's just a, I just love it in terms of diversity on the sense of, like, as you put it, there are, if you have a will, there's a way to do it. You don't have to be kind of like anointed from the time you were two. Yeah, I, my whole term term with with Quicksilver was they. I was never that person that was like, I deserve way more. Mm. You know, I I deserve more than what you give me, and I was never that person like that. And I was always that <clears throat> that kid. That was just fortunate enough to to get a sponsor, and they said we'll give you this, and I just work with that. And then, right. come the end of the year, it was like now now I, there's no excuses on why I didn't have to say anything to try and better myself to get more of a contract. It was like here's what I've done this year, mm. you know, like what are you what are you guys what are you guys going to kind of do about it? You know, I've mm. used and then yeah, and I yeah, I just never. Never, I just always just worked with what they gave me, and and then just kind of ticked boxes along the along the way throughout the year, and and then yeah, it just progressed from there. So yeah, it was never that I was never that kid that was like you know give me this amount of money because I deserve it because I did this this or this. It was you know it was the year I qualified. It was kind of like they I don't think they were expecting it. They just had it in the contract that. If I if I did qualify, it was this amount of money, and right. and and then I did so, and they kind of, I think they kind of went, oh god, like like what are we, <laughs> you know, oh, <laughs> all right, all right, then we'll, we'll just we've got to give you this now. So uh, yeah, it, I was always that kid who just ran with what they gave me. I was never asking for more or anything. So um, which led to the which just it just gave me more sense. Made, made more sense at the end of the year when, you know, for them to have to give me a little bit more or whatever to to um, roll on through the years after that. So, yeah. Position of strength, really. And, and as you exactly, said, yeah. you know, you qualified for the 2017 CT, largely under the radar. You finished fifth on the Gold Coast, which really is like, holy shit. You finish runner-up in Fiji. It's another holy shit moment. Yeah. And you, you win rookie of the year at the end of the year. And, and that must have been everyone in your circle must have been so proud. Yeah, it was a su- super surreal moment. I think after, like I said, the whole, that, like we talked about before, the whole year I feel like was very surreal um, just because everything was so new. And I went from being a kid who, <clears throat> who under the radar, who no one knew about, to getting stopped on the street going, hey, man, hey, Connor, like huge fan of your surfing, you know, keep it up. And it was kind of everything was just so new and surreal and, and going to to these amazing waves all around the world and going to, you know, surf and snapper with one person, going to the whole, the whole year was just super surreal and, um, yeah, it just all kind of fell into place, which was, which was pretty cool. Sophomore year, bit of a hangover. You, you drop to 26th and you fall off tour. 
I'm wondering if you can walk us through not not so much the experience of having to I mean the tour is so hard, right? But not so much the tour of falling off tour, but just was there anything that changed for you approach wise, mentally, physically between year one and year two that you looking back, you're like, yeah, that 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 hung me up? It was it was definitely just met my mindset on oh the first year worked so well. I'll just pick what I did up in the first year and then do it in the second year instead of trying to nitpick improvements on how to improve on 2017. It was like I thought, oh, yeah, I'll just do this because it worked and then I'll chop it into the year after. And, and then mm. <clears throat> those, those close heats that I was getting through in 2017, I was on the other side in 2018 and um, I got – uh, I, there was the year that I was also, I was not only working with Maddie Penn in Australia, I was also working with Britt. That's when Britt came in and got in, got involved as well in equipment. And uh, I just think on my behalf, my communication, because it was such a busy year, mm. the communication for myself was off, you know, two different shapers, two different outlooks on things led to the confusion of, of, you know, surfboards and, and all that. And, um, yeah, and then that whole thing as well just led to the confusion of in heats and, and then not trying to improve as well and trying to make that little 0.1% improvement on 2017 um, just led to the whole year being, being a bit of a flop really. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. Hard, hardly the first time that's ever happened. And, and <laughs> yeah. but, but like similar to, I, I mean, I wonder if there's any parallels to what you were talking about before with the year you almost qualified, but, but fell out through Hawaii. It didn't sort of ruin you. You just went, okay, well, we'll, we'll it gave you confidence. Right. And yeah. so few people have fallen off tour and then gotten back on a year later, which is, which mm. is what you did, you know? Um, and it was a year of changes. You, you qualified during the 2019 QS season for the 2020 season. Um, yeah. And in that window, uh, parted ways with Quicksilver. You, you moved up. I mean, I'm talking about the two-year window. Parted parted ways with Quicksilver. Moved up to the North Coast and Lennox Lennox area. I think you probably got married in that space. Um, yeah, yeah, got married. A lot of life change, right? In in, yeah. that, in those two years. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things happened. Um, after 2018, after Hawaii, <clears throat> I pretty much came. I came straight home, went straight to Matt Penn's shaping bay, and just went. This is what's up. This is what I, on my behalf, this is what I did wrong. This is you know, let's clear the air because that whole year was a lot of confusion in communication. Just because you know, bridge shapes differently to Penny, and therefore the you know trying to make mold them into one was so difficult purely on the base of two different shapers with two different um outlooks on things and i went straight to to penny shaping bay and we had a really long chat for an hour an hour and a half and just clarified a lot of things that needed clarifying throughout 2018 and and went back to basics on simplifying Simplifying it all again, you know, making mm. the QS is pretty, pretty. It's a pretty simple. In hindsight, you can make it make it confusing, but it's it's very simple. And um, the first board he shaped me in twenty nineteen was the board that I won the first two events on. So that whole you know clearing the air as soon as I got back from Hawaii, not going home, feeling sorry for myself and going, oh, you know, I fell off and probably never going to get back on. It was kind of like, all right, you fell off. Let's try and clear the air so then everything's all right for 2019. You can give it a red hot crack. And, and yeah, that was the, the best thing that I think happened in 2018 was just clarifying that whole that whole mess that I, I put myself in. And, uh, yeah, and then the, the board that I had, from 2019 was pretty much the board that I rode the whole year, which was uh, which was great. I would imagine that that getting through whenever it happened, 
you know, the first QS heat in 2019 after going like, I have to kind of exhale after, after falling off tour. We've, I've had, you know, coming to Jesus conversation with my, my shaper. I'm, I'm backing myself to do this again. It's still like a lot of, to me, just talking about it, like a lot of psychological pressure. And so probably getting through that first heat, whenever it happened, you're probably like, okay, this is going to work. You know, like we're going to do yeah. this. Okay. Right. Well, the, the board that I had was so good that it just gave me so much confidence to, to just catch waves and mm. ride a lot of waves and, and give myself a lot of opportunity. And I did the Maruba 1000. That was the first event of the year. And I just wanted to just, it was, it was close to home and uh, easy for me to, to go to and compete. And also it was, it was a good tester for me to see how, how I'd go in, you know, subpar waves. Cause it's, it, it was kind of a, a while since I did, you know, surfed, surf some pretty bad waves in heats. So to be able to, you know, as a big, the big guy I am to be able to match it with the little, little kids in the, um, the really bad waves that Maruba had, um, mm-hmm. that week, it was, uh, a, a very satisfying feeling. And it was also a very satisfying feeling to just win again because yeah. 2018, you know, I spent the whole year pretty much losing. So yeah. the satisfaction of even though it was a 1000, to be able to just win was was such a huge confidence booster for me at the start of the year to to keep that you know momentum rolling through the rest of the year. Makes a lot of sense. And even though it was a relationship that came through the surf shop, it was one that it seemed like was pretty good for both of you for a while. So parting ways with Quicksilver after, I'm not sure how many years you guys were together, but must have been a big step was, too. I think it was, would have been nearly 10 years, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, that was a weird one. It was, I was, uh, my contract was up in, October, mm. so it was the back end of 2019, and I uh, was I was sitting pretty good on the QS. So I think I was fifth or sixth or something. I was, you know, I was it was a week before going into Europe for the last kind of few few ten thousands for the year, and I was sitting pretty solid on looking looking good to qualify. So yeah, there was a lot of confidence going into into Europe and. Um, in the back of my mind, I knew my contract was up, and I knew that you know, my it would, it would be cut. You know, I was I wasn't expecting to be just to just flicked, yeah, to the curb, which was a super surprise for me. I just thought, you know, I had they'd cut me a bit, and I'd say yes, and we'd just keep rolling. And um, I was actually walking the do- walking walking my dogs on the beach, and and. Uh, I got a call and and they just said, "Hey, look, you know, we don't we we're not going to renew your contract and yeah, you know, thanks for everything. See you later." And kind of just sat there on the beach and had a moment and was just like, you know, what what else? You know, relaying in the back of my mind, what else did I did I need to do like mm. to to keep my sponsorship? Did I, you know, just Going back through things, going, you know, would if I did this, would I have kept my sponsor? And I think in the end of the day, myself and Jesse were in, Jesse Mendez were in the same boat and it was just because our contracts were up, it was easy for them to just not um, renew it and and it's say, you know, that that point in time in the surfing industry it's very tough and, mm. and all that. So it's you know, it's it's no one's fault. It's just it probably makes it seem like it's the person who tells you it's it's their fault, but it's it's definitely not. They're just the the person that has to tell you and and uh, relay the bad news to you, which is which is a bummer. But yeah, it was a tough little probably. You know, I had twenty minutes myself where I was like, you know, I'm nearly qualifying and looking good, and you know, no one believes in me, no one backs me. So what's the point of kind of doing it? You know, I'm only mm-hmm. human. So thinking that stuff after that happened was the first thing that, yeah, it came to my mind and, you know, after about probably half an hour, 45 minutes, I kind of flicked the switch and went, you know, all right, well, this is all on your back now and 
let's kind of show everyone that you can go through go through the mud and still come out the other end and um, kind of more the mentality of let's show everyone that you deserve to be there and um, can you also get through the bad stuff and also come on, come on the other side on top. So it was the end of 2019 was probably the most satisfying, probably the most satisfying thing in my career just because of what I went through that year, you know, losing my mate, losing Quicksilver and having to overcome that to try and keep qualifying mm. was, if not, just as satisfying as getting second in Fiji, but probably more purely of that sense of, you know, just the mental battle that I had to go through to, to get to the other end. And, um, yeah, after, after sunset, it was just the most satisfying feeling ever just to show everyone, yeah, that it, you know, there's a lot of bad times and it's just whoever overcomes it the best is um, always going to come out on top. It's good that it was motivating. I mean, it's no secret that, surf industry sponsorship since the beginning, you know, in, in fat times and in lean times, like it's hardly a meritocracy, you know, it's essentially mm. like a bunch of like blindfolded chimps throwing darts at like a wall. And it, it is one of those things, you know, and like, I feel like probably because of the post global financial crisis and the auditing of the companies and like at least a, perceivably more responsibility coming in, they're having to go, look, this person's worth this and this person's worth that, et cetera. Mm. I would say it probably didn't apply to you at all. It was probably just a general, like, look, this company has to go from here to here and all these people yeah. in the middle are, are gone. It doesn't really matter. Um, but saying that, you do have support. Um, you do have a bit of real estate on the nose of your board. Yeah. Do you think, do you think we're going to fill that up before the end of the year? What's going on behind the scenes? <laughs> I mean, I hope so. I, um, I, I mean, I just, I just want to just get back in the swing of, of making heats. So, you know, there isn't any excuses on why, um, I don't deserve a, a major sponsor. And, um, if I focus a lot of my attention on, on purely on trying to keep improving and, and making heats and making right decisions in heats, um, then I feel like everything else behind the scenes will, will fall into place. So, um, not overly focused on trying to trying to get a major sponsor. Uh, it's just, yeah, just doing the right things so then things fall into place uh, behind it. Well, you definitely have all the the tools needed um, to to compete amongst the the world title contenders on tour. You're, you're big, strong, powerful surfer. You've got the air game. You got the progressive stuff. So I'm excited to see what you do the rest of the year on that <laughs> Thanks, topic. Dave. We're, uh, we're coming up on Rottnest Island, a venue that very, very few surfers have ever even been to, let alone competed at. What, what's your experience yeah. there? None. Never been there. <laughs> there you go. I, I love <laughs> so it. So I'm just... Uh, what have what like, you heard about it? <laughs> the only thing I've heard about it is it's a mini version of Margs <laughs> and the Quokkas. The Quokka. That's right. Actually, you know, you know my mom actually got fourth in an Aussie title in Rottnest. I love that story. So yeah, she, so, so you're um, hearing this from her. She's Your mom's giving you some background on what the wave's like. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's going to give good. me some background secrets. I'm not going to tell anyone, but uh, um, no, yeah, she, so she yeah. went there for an Aussie titles and she got uh, she got fourth there. So um, yeah, she said it's just like a, it's, apparently it's just a mini version of, of Marg's and the, the left's a little bit better than what the left is at Marg's, which is great. Um, finally, finally. Finally, yeah, bring a few... Need need uh, need a few more lefts on tour. Been talking yeah. about it for bloody ages, but yeah, yeah. Um, bring back <laughs> Fiji. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it, uh, I guess it would be really exciting just because it's totally new for everyone. So everyone's on a level playing field, uh, which is which will be great. I love it. It reminds me, I know it is a rip curl search event um, this season, but it reminds me of the search CT where we used to go somewhere new every year and not everyone had been there. And that was always exciting because yeah. people were like, oh shit, like what's this like? Um, yeah. and I, Chile I stands out in my mind. Too, so. Chile, everyone was terrified when we were in Chile for 10 days and not yeah, running. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> that joint's crazy, hey? Uh, it's pretty, it's insane. 
Well, yeah. this is exciting, man. So we we did put out questions to the Instagram community. We got a couple hundred back, but we whittled it down to three. Jesus. Yeah, I know. T- tell me about Popular it. Popular man. Um, <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> First question is from Surf Top News, who asks, is there anyone that when you are matched up against them makes you think, quote, oh, shit? Um, only once when I had Kelly in round three in Fiji. Uh, what happened? Who that won the heat? Like, I did, but I was really yeah. close. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I was like sitting there going, holy shit, this is Kelly Slater. Like, <laughs> you know, as a kid, I grew up watching Kelly's footage going, never thought that I'd ever be in a position where I'd have, have to not only sit next to him in a heat, but also try and beat him. That was like probably the oh shit moment. Um, but then I was like, oh, no, nah, got to bring it back in. I've got to beat him. <laughs> so then I um, had to rein it back in. And, yeah, but there was definitely a time at the very start of the heat where I, yeah, you know, I was sitting next to him. I looked over and just saw he's he's got an aura around him that is kind of yeah, it's pretty crazy. So but yeah, I was I was I was stoked that I uh, I got on top at the end of that one. <laughs> Good answer. So this next question, I was excited about, and then when you said you were an only child, I was concerned about. But then when you mentioned you got a brother at thirteen, I think we're okay. So <laughs> Rick O'Leary O six asks, I hope this is your brother. What does your brother <laughs> tell you a lot? <laughs> that is my brother. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I think it is us. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. That's hilarious. He tells me, he always tells me to try airs or do airs. Mm. I guess, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I get into a, a stage where I, I don't try as many airs as well I usually should. And, um, yeah, he always, he's always like, you should do more airs because you know how to do them. <laughs> well, that's, and, uh, that's, that's, that's like the battle cry of youth. What, 06? So he's what, 15? Yeah, every 15 year yeah. old wants to see more airs. It's, yeah, it's he's it. like, do more airs, Connor. You know how to do them. Don't, <laughs> don't, just, do, don't just do a backside snap. <laughs> Everyone knows you know how to do them. <laughs> Good point, Rick. I like that question. Yeah. All right, the, the third one from the Instagram community is from Andy Cashford, who asks What is the mental switch? that makes life on tour more difficult during the second year? I think you touched on this a little bit already, but it'd be good to yeah, answer I, again. I, I think the mental switch is just uh, constantly improving, constantly trying to improve that, even if it's that little little bit. Um, I feel like you've always got to find ways to improve. If it's not, if it's not your surfing equipment, f- physical, mental, um, I feel like in 29, the second year, the year I fell off, actually, I spent a lot of time working with, uh, a sports psychologist. His name was Jason Patchell on the, at the, um, high performance center in Surf, surfing Australia, high performance center, mm. which was awesome because I, in 2018, I feel like that's what I needed. That's what I needed to work on was my mental, uh, mental, kind of yeah psychology of because the brain is the the best tool that you need to constantly improve on and um if you if your brain's good everything else seems to fall in place so in 2019 i worked really closely with him just you know i always thought with with sports psychology it was always something had to be bad in order to 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 go and see someone like that you know i thought that yeah, it, it had to be. There had to be a bad thing to to be able to go see mm. them to fix it. But um, you know, you don't have to have any, anything wrong with you to be able to go and fix. You know, to be able to go and see him and, and improve on what you um, what you have in your mind. And um, that's something that I worked on pretty pretty closely in 2019 was trying to get my mind right and um, accepting a lot of things that do go through your mind that are completely normal. If even if you you think they're they're strange, they're they're completely normal. So yeah, working on my brain was something that I feel like I should have done in that year, but I didn't. And therefore um, that'll be like a kind of snowball effect to to then working on your surfing as well. That's a great answer. 
Hmm. So that's it for the Instagram questions. We do have a final segment. It is the lightning round. So this is 10 questions and you yep. can answer as fast as you can. What? All right. First question. If you could only have one board set up for the rest of your life, single fin, twin fin, thruster, quad bonzer, or finless, what would you choose? Thruster. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Burrito or pizza? Burrito. Last book you read? Uh, David Goggins' uh, You Can't Hurt Me. Best surf film ever? Oh. Uh, Bobby Martinez's uh, mixtape. One wave you never have to go back to? Oh, God. One wave I never have to go back to? Huntington. <laughs> Actually, no, I do have to go back there. Uh, fuck. Um, That's okay. Emotionally, maybe you don't want to. That's fine. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind Huntington. Manly. Mm. You might never have to but go back. That's to, fair. Hopefully a bunod, but yeah, manly. It's a burden for me. I could never make heats there. If you only get to surf one wave the rest of your life. Cloud break. Best person to share the lineup with. My wife. There you go. Good answer. <laughs> worst, per, worst person to share the lineup with. Uh, ooh, worst person to share the lineup with. My mum, because <laughs> she always gets the best wives. <laughs> Last one. I finish this sentence. I will next achieve a state of happiness by. By. Winning an event. I love it. Connor O'Leary, thank you so much for joining us on the lineup. Thank you so much for ripping. And we look forward to watching more of it at Rotnest Island, man. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. It was good fun. <laughs>